The sexual revolution has failed, as the WHO recommends gay and bisexual men limit their sexual partners to reduce the spread of monkeypox. And well, the scientists at the WHO say it is not clear that monkeypox is confined to gay and bisexual groups. About 99% of the cases are among men, and at least 95% of those patients are men who've had sex with other men. Ugh. And God only knows how, but they're spreading it to their dogs now, too. And here to remind us that we live in clown world, Carl Denninger asks, How about two weeks to stop the spread? How about banning gay orgies for the next six months under penalty of arrest? They did that to people who wanted to pray, remember? So explain to me why butt-pumping 50 dudes in one night is considered a civil right, but praying in a church is not. Indeed. And I guess I would just say to remind those of you that are wondering how this happened, remember it is the strength of institutions. It is, you know, Gene Sharp's dictatorship to democracy. It isn't the relative justice that determines the strength of your negotiation power. It is the relative power capacity of the sides negotiating. And we're in a continuous state of negotiation as to what includes our civil rights. And it's been the decline of church attendance and religious influence on society that has made a lot of this silliness possible. Now, absolutely, there were flaws and things that could have been improved, but the burn everything to the ground and start from scratch is a really immature, bad idea, as we get to discover firsthand. But I want to go back to the root of this, because this all came from a lie and a fantasy that got people to abandon the traditional family and the traditional marriage, which is so important to a functioning society. It was the sexual revolution, also known as sexual liberation, and was a social change movement that challenged traditional codes of behavior related to sexuality and interpersonal relationships throughout the United States and the developed world from the 1960s to the 1970s. And it's fairly easy to see how this idea was sold to men. I mean, the attractiveness of women is kind of callously, but accurately can be rated on a scale of 1 to 10. And of course, you present the average man with the idea of as many sexual partners as he can possibly manage to pull in. Well, he's going to picture himself with 9s and 10s night after night. Of course, the reality of that is far different, and what ended up happening is, well, you have to look at the male sexual hierarchy in order to understand a little bit better. Now, using Vox Day's social sexual hierarchy, although you can kind of use any of these deviations, you know, the pickup artist, alpha, beta paradigm, or whatever you want, men tend to fall into general categories. There's the gamma male, the kind of lower desirable weirdo guy that has his kind of weirdo girlfriend. There's the delta male, the average hardworking guy who makes up the majority of the male population and makes society function. The problem with the delta male is he just isn't terribly exciting or interesting to women. There's the bravo in this chart or beta or whatever, the second highest ranking man, which is kind of the guy that or group of men that hang around with the famous guy, the guys that hang around Charlie Sheen, or the guys that hang around the quarterback, or the ultimately the alpha male. And the alpha male would be the Donald Trump, the John Elway, the Tiger Woods, the high school quarterback, the college superstar. There isn't very many of them. Well, what did the women think when they heard sexual revolution and you can just break the bonds of marriage? Well, just like the men thought they would be getting the nines and tens, the women thought it would be the alphas. And since women tend to have a little less promiscuity burned into their biology, they thought they would be extracting commitment out of the alphas, which is absurd because alphas have limitless number of choices. And so male attractiveness is a little less based on just raw appearance, but it is very much as real as female attractiveness, it just tends to depend on your social 
ranking in the hierarchy and, you know, the way you're able to manifest and display your confidence. And so they got women deluded with these ideas of feminism that you can have it all. You can be a single mom, you can have a career, and you can have the alpha doctor model weightlifter boyfriend full of charm and charisma and money and his ultimate and total attention, love, and adoration. When in in reality, model doctor weightlifter boyfriend has a ton of women at his beck and call. Well, what happens? Well, the average man, the Delta man, gets left on the sideline. He can't get one woman to commit to him because they're all chasing the men of the highest value. Those women find that they can get one night of commitment out of the Alpha, and then he never calls them again. They're left raising his spawn, which then regular guys find completely unattractive because they don't want to take on another man's burden. And so the average man and the average woman become mutually repellent to one another. And everybody's unhappy, miserable, and alone. Oh, look, the atomization of society. It almost looks like it was planned. So most men are now forced into singleness and loneliness And most women are forced into fantasizing about that one night that they almost got the good guy and that there's no good men out there anymore. Well, society used to encourage and require them to commit to a good, hardworking delta that would create a healthy, lifelong relationship. Well, the alpha males are living the life that everyone thought they would be living under the sexual revolution, but then they were living that life anyway. So there's a couple weird consequences. The first is this rise of worshipping the attractive women, the OnlyFans pages and stuff, where these young girls are finding themselves making tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, selling and doing bizarre things to all of these men that are below the bravo and level of the hierarchy that can't find anyone And of course, high fructose corn syrup and carb-heavy diets didn't help because it encouraged more and more women to develop the most unattractive feature a woman can have on her body, which is being overweight. But the funny part is, so you would think these attractive women, well, they're at the top of the female hierarchy. They must be happy from the sexual revolution. I mean, they got rich, only to find out that, yes, they have all the money, But those alpha and bravo men that they want to date, once those men find out that they're whores, don't have any interest in them. I don't go looking for a girlfriend to provide for me. You know, ultimately, and as you get older, too, you look for a mommy, you look for a caretaker, you look for a nurturer. And of course, you look for a girlfriend. I mean, no illusions about that. But these women are finding those that fully embrace the values of the sexual revolution are now down there with the much more unattractive women and that men don't want anything to do with them because yes your value in the hierarchy is one through ten but once men get that like okay she's pretty enough for me then they start looking at your values compatibility personality reliability And what those women that have done the OnlyFans thing find is, I used to be able to date Bravos, and now I have to go down to Deltas that don't mind my past. No curse greater than dating below your potential. And it's weird. The other thing, a lot of those women that were chasing the doctor, weightlifter, model, you know, whatever lawyer boyfriend find is, they leave their Delta husband Well, they find a new guy who maybe looks a little different, but he's just another delta. You're not moving up and down the hierarchy. A six is going to get a six. A seven is going to get a seven. But because male attractiveness isn't solely based on looks, it's taken people a long time to realize. Just as if you're a man and you're a five, you're dating a five. Now, there has been some interesting developments in uh, the early 2000s Pickup artists became popular. Men found that you could fake pump up your confidence, good eye contact, social graces, thing, techniques, agree and amplify, that women kind of have an algorithm they run 
when they test men to try to determine their value, because women's algorithm is less looks-based and more personality and confidence-based. So men within limits are able to kind of adjust their level of attractiveness. And at night, at the bar, in a loud situation, you can mimic certain characteristics that an alpha male embodies naturally and without effort, and you can kind of score the dream of, well, dating up a level or two. But then it leads to this odd situation where you're a 40-something-year-old man and you're still going out to the bar and club every night, walking up to women and being like, hey, how are you doing? You, you want to do it till you're 50? You want to do it till you're 60? It's just this continuous indulgence in basically childhood, basically something our grandparents and great-grandparents got out of the way at 17. Then you got hitched and started having a family. And I know that... A lot of people, the sanctity of marriage, the idea of not being able to have a no-fault divorce is abhorrent to them. You know, a phrase we used to hear but don't hear anymore is we're staying together for the children. Nobody stays together for the children anymore. We're at the point of pure selfishness and self-indulgence now. But being a child in the 80s, I remember my mom pointing kids out to me at the playground whose parents had gotten divorced. You know, I mean, it was a big deal. And I remember it like, oh, look, they have a stepbrother. And I was like, what the heck is a stepbrother? And now it's just so common. More marriages end in divorce than, you know, are carried out successfully. And we tend to ignore the damage that that does. You know, Kurt Cobain, the patron saint of sarcasm, nihilism, and self-destruction, was by all accounts a normal, happy kid until he was nine. And his parents got divorced. In fact, in one of his last interviews ever, shortly before he killed himself, he said, I'm the happiest I've ever been since the divorce. And this was a divorce that was initiated by his mother, who left her quiet type husband. She explained to the kids what was happening in the car. Well, the father lived in denial for years. Note, the father was a quiet type guy, probably an ordinary, uh, regular Delta guy. She left him for who she, someone she probably thought was a higher value man, much more aggressive, much more dominant. In fact, he ended up breaking her arm in an argument. Ooh, charming. But in reality, he was probably another Delta, another hardworking guy that showed up to work every day, except this time with an anger problem. As some of my mom's friends have told her later in their life, on their third marriage, if I knew how this would end up, I would have stayed with the first guy. And Kurt's complete emotional breakdown from this divorce, it isn't unique to him. It isn't like he's just some freak that was affected by it more. I, I work with a young lady who's psychologically broken, and she tells stories about her past, and she has two phases in her life when my parents were together, and after the divorce. She drives a Jeep because when she was a little girl, she had a Barbie Jeep that she used to drive before the divorce. She's tried to order her life. She's tried to bring happiness into her life by seeking out and bringing in symbols from her life before the divorce. You know, we don't even think about the damage that this does to children anymore this sexual revolution, this fantasy, this lie that people are sold that you can be a five or a six, but you can get that perfect 10. You can have it all. And you can't. You can't be whatever you want. You can't do anything. And you can't have anyone. And so then at last we get to the homosexual community and particularly the male side of things. The women, the female side of things tends to be the lower women that could only probably date a gamma male, and they don't want to, so they find a woman of similar social value and go, well, at least I can get that. But for the men, it seems to be like the endless satiation of the raw animal lust. I mean, we tend to fill up fairly quick and can outpace women on a cycle. This is why the alpha male has harems. But the men that can't be alphas, some of them seem to settle for just as many dudes as they can possibly get together and they have, you know, who knows, 15 men sandwiches, whatever. But now the who is telling them, well, maybe you need to try monogamy. 
I mean, trust the science. Maybe trust the religion. We've been warned about this and the consequences of this in the Old Testament. It takes a long time for science and the scientific method to catch up with what made a successful, healthy, happy society for thousands of years, and it turns out, well, it doesn't have the worst farming techniques in it either. We're relearning things that people took for granted for thousands of years. By, by doing the opposite, you know, what if we do all the opposite of everything that we were taught? Oh, we end up in hell. And that's kind of where the sexual revolution has ended. I mean, the alpha males are happy and buried in women, just like always. But everyone else, the men, are mostly lonely, or if they were successful, they're uh, destroyed by alimony. The women are lonely with a child that no man wants to claim. The... Uh, promiscuous are finding themselves infested with strange and novel diseases that, uh, well, they're pretty gross and terrifying and have become a global pandemic of their own, right? The pickup artists have discovered basic truths like have some confidence and make some decent eye contact. You'll be fine, kid. And they've essentially retreated into the endless days of the first three weeks of a freshman kid's life at college. Hey, how are you? My name's Mike. Nice to meet you. Yes, how deep and ultimately satisfying that would be. No one has benefited. Society is worse off than ever. And it has been an emotional war against children. It creates these broken families, broken, emotional. It's probably where the SJW comes from. I wonder how many SJWs came from healthy, happy families, right? The emotionally stunted are more easily manipulated by propaganda, consistently looking for what? A, a parental figure. In this case, they project it onto the state. Oh, look, more leftism, more communism, more good. If white privilege is anything, it's coming from a family where the parents stayed together and help you get off on the right foot when you're 18, because God knows it's hard enough to build a life even with, you know, an education and a, a place to live and building your resume and getting job experience, the world smacks you down. At least you have a solid base if you have a unified family. And this is a point made in Gene Sharp's Dictatorship to Democracy, or really what we went from was more a transition from democracy or republic to dictatorship, atomized citizenry. And Gene Sharp makes the point that Revolutions that receive outside aid are rarely successful because it is the citizens themselves that need to become competent. They need to become independent. They need to do it for themselves. The change has to come in, come from within, not from without. And I mean, look at a couple of examples that Nina Jankowitz, the Ministry of Truth, was mocked into oblivion. That came from within. That came from a culture that's been developing for some time now. The Cheney dynasty has just been decisively defeated. Now, I never thought I'd see the day where liberals and leftists are supporting a Cheney and lamenting her defeat. But if we were just going and, and only listening to the legacy media, we'd think she was the greatest thing that ever was, but she got crushed. So it shows how institutions, organizations, communities, families, whatever it is, a non-atomized population, people working together can have a major impact on social change. This is why Merrick Garland sends the FBI after parents that are resisting state-sponsored indoctrination. They fear it because it is powerful. Remember, in negotiations, it is not the relative justice that determines the outcome. It is only the relative power. And nothing has taken more power away from the individual in the West than the sexual revolution.